Welcome to another episode of Simon Says, where facts come first. It's your host, Jenny Simon. And we're going to get into, right into our topic today. But first, we'll take a quick break and come right back. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode. Welcome back. Booker T. Washington, April 15, 1856 to November 14, 1915, was an American political, an African-American political leader, educator, and author. He was one of the most dominant figure in American, African-American history in the United States. From, 19, from 1890 to 1915. He was advisor to several presidents of the United States. Born into slavery, he became the leading voice of the former slaves and their descendants. He once said, a lie doesn't become truth. Wrong doesn't become right and evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by a majority. In other words, don't be hypocrite. Don't be deceptive. I want you to listen to this clip by the now Attorney General, Honorable Claudette Joseph. No country can run a proper CBI program if the officials around it are corrupt. NDC therefore demands that there must be substantial changes to the CBI law now. These changes must include, one, making it a criminal offense punishable by long jail time to sell diplomatic passports. Two, making it mandatory for the names, addresses, and countries of origins of all persons applying for and obtaining CBI status to be published. Three, making it illegal for government officials to invest in CBI approved projects. This is a clear conflict of interest. Four, requiring stringent due diligence that is not influenced by government officials. Five, removing some of the powers of the minister into the hands of an independent, qualified body. And six, barring persons acquiring CBI status from being able to vote in our elections. We, um, we're going to listen to another clip pertaining to the same issue, the CBI, this time from Honorable, the former Prime Minister, Honorable Tillman Thomas. Law? Well, initially, the, the, the original law, mm -hmm. it, it's a public, this is a public business. This is not a private uh, business. The original law, under the original law, as I understand it, the names had to be published. Mm -hmm. But of all those who, are, who apply for and obtain Grenadian passport, but the parliament met subsequently and amended the law. Yeah. So that you, the persons who apply for passport, they don't have to reveal. That in itself is a danger. Government is not a secrecy. Government is not operating secretly. You are operating, as I said, you are trusted for the people. And the people must know what is happening. You cannot be holding things secretly and, and the people you represent do not know about it, especially something like uh, our passport. So I asked about the list. And I was told 
the law do not allow naming of citizens and of course the information, the address and, and so on. So I then asked, the NDC has been back in office for a year and a quarter now. And why haven't they gone back, gone to parliament and amend that law and bring it back to where it was so that we can see the listing of who's holding our passports, their nationalities, and so on and so on. We heard the chairman of the CBI program, Mr. Richard Duncan, telling us that 90% of the persons who purchased passports in the first quarter of um, the year 2023 are Russians. So, but we don't know who these people are. Why, if you, if you saw against the amendment, why didn't you go back and fix it? Why are you speaking about it, but come in and going along doing the same thing that is hypocritical? However, the law allows for a six month report on the work of the CBI. And since taking office, as I said, a year and a quarter now, this transparent administration has not filed any such report in parliament. Nothing, zip, zero, nothing was filed. Moving along. While we are on CBI, I want you to play this clip on Mr. Adrian Persuader Thomas, Minister in Adrian Persuader Thomas. That was the voice of the National Democratic Congress's acting political leader, Adrian Thomas, speaking at the demonstration held Sunday, February 28th at the site of the Sixth Sense Hotel project, currently under construction in La Suggest St. David. The demonstration, which called for the preservation of the natural habitats and environment in the area, was organized by the NDC. So I saw on, on, on Facebook and on, on, I think it was his page, the minister's page, where he was speaking of the achievements of St. David's since they've been, they came into office in June 23, 2022. And um, it was amazing to see because this same project that Adrian Thomas then acting leader of the NDC had condemned for many reasons, went on the people's side with megaphone and an audience, as you see a crowd protesting against the project is what is carrying this in David's constituency these days, not a word. Not a word, but they're posing and posting pictures of the community centers and, and, and you just name it, schools, fix it, that that project, and by the way, which is going to bring jobs and, and, and tourism to that constituency that was condemned by the said minister, Adrian uh, Thomas, today. So we are now in a, at a stage where we don't mind anymore what the natural habitat and the mangrove and whatever. It's all right. It's all right because it's NDC in office. And at that time, the project came to Grenada through the NNP while the NNP was in office. But it's okay now because it's NDC in office. 
We are not living in a Grenada where nepotism and the likes, tribalism and, 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 and um, those are, it's okay. It, it, it's, it's not, you know, we, we, can't, we can't have that. It's, it's not that anymore. It's, it's okay. We have a very short list of persons who has been going around and it's been placed on around on, on most of the boards. I'm sure you've heard the names plentiful. Rodney George and 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 um the uh, uh, Richard Duncan and you know there are these names that show up for the most part you just hearing as advisors the same set of people and mind you most of them if not all of them are retirees they are retirees. What happened to the long list that the government had received of applicants, people wanting to serve in different positions on boards or within the, the, the administration? What happened to the young ones, the youth that they preached about? What happened? the same names over and over. But today, today, tribalism and nepotism and victimization, they're all accepted because NDC is in office, it's okay. The prime minister owns a company that is a CBI agent. Well, he said he re they removed his uh, his his email address, and so I guess we could say he himself, the Prime Minister Honorable Deacon Mitchell, is no longer a part of the agents that the company. Right? He has a member of his cabinet who is or was an agent and his advisor, his advisor who is an agent. And as he said, there's no need for her to remove herself. When asked about the conflict of interest, the Prime Minister said he and Minister Cornwall, who are or was or is agents, will recruit themselves from the cabinet if the matter arises. He said that they have already done so a couple of times. The Prime Minister is the head of the cabinet. The prime minister has to sign off. He is a, the, the line minister and has to sign off on the applications of these investors when they apply for our, our passports. Listen, they don't take my word for it. Listen to what the prime minister had to say about that. The prime minister, uh, what have you done and other members of your administration who were CBI agents before the election uh, to ensure to minimize notions of conflicts of interest. So in other words, um, as uh, as your law firm uh, is registered as, as a CBI agent, so is uh, Mr. Cornwall and Ms. Andrea St. Bernard, what are you doing to ensure that uh, there are no conflicts of interest there? Well, just to, to clarify, my firm, my law firm has never been a CBI agent. That's what. Well, ex I, except I, I on the let website. On, go ahead. No, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. I, I've, I've been at pains to say that. I, I was yes. a partner, not my firm, myself. I was a partner in a separate business it's called Mitchell and Partners, Inc., where I was the principal okay. of, that, of, that, of that entity. Both mm -hmm. as it relates to my law firm and that entity, I do not practice. Right? Okay. Um, so, so that's clear. Um, and I've made that clear. I do not work in my law firm, nor do I work in, in Mitchell and, and Partners. And so I certainly have nothing to do with, um, with this. In fact, I think I've made a point. I've been at pains to communicate to the CBI office uh, repeatedly um, that obviously I'm not a practicing CBI agent. Uh, similarly, I'm not a practicing attorney at law because I am unable to do so. 
And the same, I think, applies for, for uh, Honourable Minister Cornwall, um, who, who holds a ministerial portfolio. So therefore, as a public servant, she can't practice uh, privately. The St. Bernard is an advisor to the government, but she's not a public servant in the same capacity as myself and uh, Mr. Minister Cornwall. And so in those circumstances, she, uh, her business uh, continues. So what I can certainly say to you, um, that from in my capacity as, as Prime Minister and uh, former Minister of Finance, uh, certainly if any applications were to come to cabinet um, that in any way or form would have been in, in coming from or emanating from because the way CBI works is you can have applications that might have been started an entire year but would, would not reach cabinet we certainly have recused like, ourselves there is a due diligence process that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so we certainly would have recused ourselves um, from any decision as to whether or not to grant or not to grant approval in those circumstances I can certainly say to you in my time in, in, in cabinet there's only been one instance where I had to do so and I believe there's been one instance where uh, Minister Connell would have had to do so, and obviously the minister reflected that we would not have been part of, of the decision. So, I'm guessing here from what the Prime Minister said, he, he doesn't work in his law firm anymore. I guess he doesn't collect the monies that his law firm is making right now. It's going to the workers only. And same with his company, his, his agent company. Mitchell, what Mitchell and partners that he has, he's not a beneficiary and he collects no funds from that company as well. <laughs> oh, come on, we smarter than that. We smarter than that, you know. So, the said CBI project program that the NDC had issues with. The NDC of yesterday and the persons involved in the NDC of today that was in the NDC of yesterday, which are many, are just going along merrily and saying nothing, saying nothing. I guess nothing is wrong because your prime minister now is heavily involved was heavily involved. And so he cannot really condemn that CBI program because he's a part of it. And so now we are merrily going on, going along as though nothing is wrong and saying nothing. Moving along, we're speaking about hypocrisy and deception today. Play the clip with Minister Andy Williams. I'm wrong right now. And this is why I'm making the lie. That if you speak, you get victimized. And this is wrong. Because we should be able to speak. I am not, I can tell you I'm not a yes man. Right? We should be able to speak. If NDC is in power right now, we should be able to say exactly what we don't like that is going on in government. If an NMP, vice versa, same thing. Right? There's a fear going on right now that if you talk, you're going to get victimized. And that has to stop. We have to stop that. Whoever is doing it, we have to expose them. Today, more change. And it's, and I quote, guys, stay focused. You have to stay focused. Let's hear it. I'm seeing the NMP putting out some statements trying to mislead the people of Greenland, like Kaiko and Pidimatnik. I'm saying, guys, stay focused. I want you to listen to a clip by Honorable Minister Joseph Ander. You can't have a situation where your general hospital is understaffed, under equipped, women going in there healthy and losing their babies for very pre preventable reasons. We have to do better than that in and for our country. I agree, Minister Ander. We have to do better than that. And I hope I hear you speaking of, of the women that losing their babies and their lives at that general hospital now, more than ever, the mortality rate 
of infants and their mothers are more now at the general hospital than ever before. I did a couple of programs myself. And since then, I've been bombarded with calls from various people, family members. In some cases, when the mother survived, the mothers themselves. One that stood out to me most, I spoke to a partner of a young lady who lost her life and, and was buried um, last week, last week, Tuesday the 19th. Tuesday the 19th of September. Her name was Chanel Alexis. And she was pregnant with twins. They took her to Abdul section to, to, to remove the twins. The twins survived. She lost a lot of blood. She went into ICU. She spent one month in the general hospital before she died, went back and forth from ICU to the ward, and eventually she died in ICU. One of the reasons she had to be taken back to theater, when they figured that out, they had left gauze inside of her and had to take her back to remove it. She couldn't, they couldn't take her back because she was in ICU and she was still very weak and couldn't sustain another operation to reopen her and remove the gauze. So they had to wait when she built up a little energy enough to take her back. And after one month of fighting for her life, because she had her twins and between her and her partner, they have eight kids, eight children, all in school, in, in school, school age, none above to, to, to look after fighting for her life, and she eventually died. I mean, it's a long story. It's, a, it's horrid when you hear most of it. I'm, I'm not going to, uh, well, I wouldn't say bore you because it, it, it is a story that should be told. Um, but we're moving right along because what we're showing here is the hypocrisy, right, of these people. So I'm asking Minister Con, Miss Minister Andel, I'm sorry, to speak out. If you don't know, go find out and speak out. The hospital doesn't even have bandages, bandages. Well, not the hospital, but the health system, because in the clinics and so, they've gone as low as not having bandages, among everything else that we know of. But I, 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 I'm telling you how bad it is. And while I'm on Minister Ander, I see you posing with the Chinese. You went to China and you're looking good, posing with the Chinese. Chinese build a bridge for you up in, up in St. Patrick West. They cannot be just posing with the Chinese. You was the same minister who used the adjective slimy to describe the Chinese and said that Grenada was, well, we, soon we're going to be speaking Chinese and had enough to say about the Chinese. The NBC administration was the administration who had the NNP administration remove Chinese looking gazebos up at Granitan. Because what? We becoming Chinese now, Chinese take over. But the gazebos that was placed up there for people to sit and enjoy when they visit in the lake, we had that removed. Remember when the, the Minister of Tourism, at the time Clarice Modest Cohen, said, we don't want to bite the hands that feed us, referring to the Chinese? And we brought down hell on her? It's a lucky thing we didn't bite the hand. Because where did I get that hand now to feed you? My good friend, Mr. Andrew, I like to see you, you're posing, you look good in your suit next to the Chinese uh, Foreign Affairs Minister there. Mm -hmm. You look real good, real good. Moving on.
the GDB. One of the things the NDC administration then and now were adamant about was the rebuilding of institutions. And I don't see nobody could fault anybody for wanting that. Even if we could, we could get better. So building our institutions and making them strong is always a good thing. And of course, accountable, transparent and accountable. You know they call the NDC and Okatili, of course, Mr. Transparency, Accountability and Good Governance. Let us listen to the now Prime Minister on the G GDP situation. Obviously, we are doing that is addressing our lending institutions, like the Grenada Development Bank, which we say on an NDC will be focused on the productive sectors. GDB should be the ones giving loans to fishermen. GDB should be the ones giving loans to our farmers. GDB should be the ones giving loans to our agro processors. GDB should not be involved in giving loans to buy vehicles. Or frankly, to even buy homes. That is for commercial and retail banking. You are a development bank. Your job is to back and support our businessmen and women who are the ones that will provide the employment to our fellow Grenadians so that they can go and get a loan from a commercial or retail bank. The Grenada Development Bank is under fire for approving a controversial $2 million loan. It's time for the GDB board to step down. GDB granted a $2 million loan to Minister Andy Williams, violating the bank's governing laws and raising ethical concerns. I applied for a loan to expand my business. They take so long to answer me. Then they said I was denied said a young farmer from St. Andrew. It's not right that a government minister can get such a huge loan while we struggle to make ends meet, said an angry young businesswoman. This scandal sends a dangerous message. It is unacceptable for public officials to benefit from unethical practices while small businesses suffer. Millions of dollars was lent or loaned, was given to at least two ministers of government going against the laws of the bank for one millions now being a minister is a temporary job we all know that it's a temporary job and how do you loan we have temporary workers going to banks for loan and not getting it and you're talking five thousand and ten thousand dollars loan because they have a temporary job and how do we loan millions, both of them exceeding a million dollars, millions to our ministers who are now holding temporary jobs? Minister Andy was an entrepreneur before he became a minister. He had a business and he couldn't pay his loans. He was writing bonds checks. And as I say that, I saw a young man being hauled away to court on, on, on TV in the, in the evening news just this past week. Don't quite remember the, the date. Charged several counts of fraud for writing Bong's check. He looked about the same age, around the same age of our minister, of most of our ministers. Young man being hauled away because it's a crime. Yes, it is. It's a crime. And I think, well, not now, but he has served recently, quite recently, as our acting prime minister. More than once, more than one, more than one occasion, he was served as our acting prime minister. Hypocrisy. There are young people as the clip suggests, and I could attest to it, who been to that bank to get loan, the same development bank, and was refused. And some asked to, to, to put up collateral for measly amounts or turned away. And we're talking about youth and entrepreneurship and jobs.
this has to stop. And this is all because of the nepotism that's taking place. The board is an NDC board. The entire board. And not just ordinary NDC members. We have former minister of, uh, on the board. We have the, the now uh, Piero, not Piero, treasurer of the party and an advisor to the prime minister and a lot of other things to do with this government, to the administration, chairing the board and all as supporters, strong supporters of the NDC. And so they're making manje purport with the, with the money inside GDP. And you hear of people saying they go applying for loans now and they're saying they don't have money. How they gonna have when they're giving millions away to their own, own, own people? Going against the laws. In my research, and I did because I want to know if this is a thing that happens. And that it is safe to say that not one minister or MP of the former administration had received loan or any kind of money from the Grenada Development Bank. Not one. And that says a lot. That says a whole lot. We might just have to change the name of the bank. Hmm? NDCCB, National Development Congress Cabinet Bank. The bank is used as a trampoline now for the NDC. I also want to speak of the roads and the, and the box drains, the concrete roads that we used to call the NNP government, the concrete government. All they do is building roads and box drains. And we're not supposed to speak about it and we're not supposed to thank them. Nobody's supposed to thank them for it because that's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. These days, roads, everybody posing by a stretch of road, concrete road, and the box drains. And that's the only thing, the only thing the different representative of the different constituency can speak about that they do. And, 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 and the prime minister himself, when he was speaking in, um, in the one year, after his one year celebration, and he was speaking in, in uh, a town hall, the large town hall and said, only one name he called, Minister Andy Williams. Imagine, and, and most of the, the supporters, they agree and they said, Minister Williams is the only one working. Imagine that Minister Williams is the one we have to emulate in that party, the only one. Could you imagine that? We're in deep trouble. So the prime minister said that, you know, Andy was doing well in implementation and blah, nobody else, because nobody else doing anything except building concrete road at box drains that now it's a great achievement, but then it wasn't. And all they're doing is building box drains and, 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 but all the projects that the NDC are completing now or has started was projects started by the new national party or in the pipeline, as we see, that they were able to materialize. But they wasn't doing anything and all they had was box drain and concrete roads. <laughs> Moving along, moving along. You know, I've seen the supporters and heard the supporters of both parties, both sides of the fence. They get upset, really upset when someone referred to the leader and the prime minister at the time by the first name. Who are they talking to? Who are they talking about? Why you not respect? And give him his accolades, the honorable with Dr. Mitchell is the right honorable Dr. Mitchell. And with um, Deacon Mitchell, it's the honorable prime minister, Deacon Mitchell. And I agree. I fully agree with that. And I try my best to 
give them their honors. I, I, I do it, I try my best. I might get into the Easter thing and say the name just so, but I quickly, I quickly go back and, and, and apologize and go back and, and give them their honors. I want you to listen to this script. And every time you hear the word seed, it creates a buzz on the island. I don't know why they can put me in this ministry, you know. I don't know why they can put me in this ministry, you know. I don't know why they can put me in this ministry, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> seed need a ministry for itself. No, this, I'm not grinning with, with, with Gloria. I'm not grinning with her. This was a public forum. It was a town hall meeting and Minister Gloria Thomas was supposed to present on her ministry. So she was there in the capacity of the minister responsible for the SEED program in that Ministry of Social Development. It's not a joke. Whatever happens behind closed doors in cabinet with you and Deacon and number 10 and all of them, because I've heard several, more than one person speak of you practically being the, 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 the clown in the classroom. But we don't have time for that. We don't need to know all these things. Even, even the minister for that constituency where the tongue out was, was held, Minister Kareem James, Mention it. Mention uh, Minister Gloria and her, her, her mouth. But she, could, she wouldn't say. And some of them say they can't even repeat some of the things you say. We have time for that. You're a big woman. You come out from the era, where, the era where people have respect. And, and, and this nonsense, this clonging around, take it behind closed doors. And, 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 and let's get this thing going. We cannot be playing around with the entire nation. We're talking about a country here and the development of our people. 65% of our people are youth. 65%. What is the example we set in? You come to give some report and you grinning like a chef she can chop up, listen. You too big for that? You too big for that? We have to move on. Let's get this thing going. I feel to get behind and push. <clears throat> Let's go. Come on, man. We just, it's a, a bunch of inept people running a country by ignorance and arrogance. I ordered the Play-Doh, but hey, Richard, I think it coming with the coconut trees from Brazil that Minister Andy have on order. They've been coming. <laughs> oh God. Listen, what is it? Tea doesn't laugh at uh, what? Skin teeth is not always good. Some something, I forget the, the, the phrase. But this is not a laughing matter. Be an example. Be an example. You see, that's the thing. This whole ministerial thing seems to be a joke for most of you. And all it does is show up your incompetence, which is right now overwhelming. None can help the other. We have persons, our advisors, Advisors need advisors themselves. They need to be advised themselves. But the nepotism is raging. We, we have to use our people, our boys and girls, whether they suit the job or not. 
we have to use them. And the whole thing falling apart. A big mess. You learning on the job. Everybody learning on the job, so none could tell the other. But this is people's lives and livelihoods we're dealing with there. We're dealing with a country. It's not play play. It's not cuckoo tail under the house. So at the end of the day, you get up, you go home back to normal until the next day or whenever you come back to play your cuckoo tail. This is a nation we're dealing with. We'll take a quick break and come right back. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode. Welcome back. So I didn't look at the Crown speech in its entirety. But I want to, I, 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 I saw snippets in the news as usual, and some of it, some of it alive. I will deal with the Crown speech in its entirety once I get there. But I, it would be remiss of me not to touch on this oil and gas business that is over there. And it's rare, rare, rare for some people. And it's nay, nay, nay for some people. The first, I want I, I want you to listen to this clip. Of today, we are yet to solve the mystery of Grenada's offshore oil and gas reserves. Very little records can be found anywhere within the government, and our technocrats within the ministries and departments have very little information on this matter. This situation is untenable and completely unacceptable, and my government is committed to doing all within its power to unearth the mystery of Grenada's oil and gas status. The Governor General was handed a politically charged Crown speech to read. The Governor General, as we would say, is above the fray. She is above the, pol the politics, or should be above the politics. Because we've had um, GGs who were very political. But yet, still, when it came to the Crown speeches, the Crown speeches are never that political. That content that the GG just read should have been in a town hall meeting. And it right away reminded me of the cabinet conclusion. So is that another red herring? Because we know the last couple of months has been pretty rough for this administration. A whole collusion of failures. We heard about faith. We heard about CJs, I think it was. And who going to jail? Where is the investigation? Where are we at now with CJs and faith? We're asking. I'm asking for the people on behalf of the people. Because these things come out, boom. And people, eh? Who? Oh. Huh? Was that another, an, another distraction of the Kiwana Bay? We have a whole lot of things that happened quite recently. And, and mind you, I'm not defending the NNP and if, if what the prime minister say is, is true, they have found no documents, whoever is responsible, if, if documents was removed, if that, whatever, whoever is responsible should pay, whatever the consequences are. But then we had to go into the administration and make people responsible for the consequences as well. Right? Yes. And we heard the 
former Prime Minister, Dr. Mitchell, speaking about gas. In polls, I think it was their final rally leading up to the, the, the uh, 2018 elections. Let's hear it. The report said that we have found significant gas and oil in the waters of Grenada in one well so far. Brothers, one well. We have several more, several more wells which are even more exciting than the one they just found. An announcement was made is that the former Minister of Finance, Honorable Nazim Burke, who, um, and, and Minister of Energy at the time, in the 2008 to 13 NDC reign in office, to chair, to chair that um, a, a new committee formed to investigate where the documents, the oil and gas documents are. Well, I say we have to, they're the wrong person to chair it because we have to investigate the NDC of 2008 to 13 as well. If, if there was no documents found, because here's Mr. Buck. Grenada may be officially entering the oil and gas market by March next year. The way has been cleared with the recent signing of an energy cooperation agreement between Grenada and Trinidad. This was done as a follow-through to the Maritime Boundary Delimitation Agreement, which was signed between both countries in 2010. Maritime boundary negotiations between Grenada and Trinidad and Tobago restarted in 2009 after they failed to reach consensus during talks in the 1990s. Finance Minister Nazem Bouk has announced that the two countries will cooperate in conducting seismic searches of the maritime waters to determine what hydrocarbon resources lie in Grenada waters and where they are located. Based on the program of work that we have now developed and identified, we can say that it is the intention of both governments to go to market jointly with a block for exploitation for exploration as early as March of next year. This would mark a very historic step in the history of our country because this would be Grenada's official entry into the oil and gas industry. The agreement also states that the two countries will be able to jointly hire seismic companies to conduct searches. They also agreed to the establishment of a joint development zone to determine when and how blocks will be put on the international market. For the first time, it will allow us to cooperate in the field of training of our people. The Trinidad is going to help us to train some of our own people to prepare them for entry into the hydrocarbon industry. It will allow for cooperation in the sharing of seismic data. So information that they have about oil and gas location, they will share with us. And what we find, we will share with them. Finance and other officials say it will be a major development for Grenada should searches reveal that oil and gas are indeed present in its territorial waters. They say this will be a major boost for what is evidently a severely cash-strapped economy. Eugenia Peters, GBN News. If Mr. Burke, Mr. Nazim Burke, Nazim B. Burke, is chairing that committee, isn't that conflict of interest? But then again, the prime minister said, Grenada is too small for us to get away from conflict of interest. And that's Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell. I just want to finish off here by saying what was done to the governor general was nasty. That was nasty. The governor general is above politics and should not be included in dirty politics. If I was, I would have resigned. As a matter of fact, I would not have redact if I were the GG. And I would resign with immediate effect. It don't matter because according to our constitution, if she resigns, she gets in the same salary until she dies. I don't know why she around there taking that sort of, of, of disrespect and disregard. I would have long gone. You understand? So we're going to move quickly 
into our is it true section because we are quickly running out of time as usual. How many of you remember this photo? And subsequently, this clip. So I haven't actually seen the story that was circulated yesterday. I was told about it. Um, but to be clear, we have not appointed anyone. And um, to the contrary, we've indicated that we are recalling and are in the process of recalling everyone. So that's the most I can say. I don't know the basis or the genesis for the story. Um, if there were appointments that were made by the prior administration, the same applies. Uh, whether they were made uh, two or three years ago or whether they were made six days before the elections, um, the same applies. Uh, we are recalling everyone. I met the gentleman last Monday evening. Uh, it was a courtesy call that he asked to pay uh, to me. Uh, he was accompanied by another Grenadian who also was appointed as a diplomat um, by the prior administration. And when he made that courtesy call, he asked for a photo and the photo was given. Um, when I met the gentleman, I certainly was not under the impression, um, nor did he convey to me, that he had been appointed uh, as any diplomat. Okay, bear that in mind. The Government Gazette dated Friday, September 22nd, 2023, number 48, printed a list of diplomatic appointments that was terminated, 83 of them, I counted. Second to last on the list, is the name Tushi Narari. I hope I got that right. Tushi Narari as honorary counsel. It captioned, please be advised that cabinet at its meeting 8th August 2023 terminated with immediate effect diplomatic appointment of the persons listed in the attached list. Annex A. And the document was signed by Roxy, Mrs. Roxy McLeish Hutchison, Permanent Secretary of Foreign Affairs. The question is how did Mr. Tushi Narari, Nawari's name, get on that diplomatic list? Because we heard the Prime Minister said that even if he was a member of the diplomatic corps of the former administration, they was cleaning out the list. They were getting rid of everybody who was there, right? The prime minister said he didn't know who the man was. He didn't, he didn't ask to see him. He was, because that is because there was a rumor that the gentleman was going to be ambassador at large to Grenada for Nigeria. But Mr. Tushi Narari's name is on the list. How did it get there? So I did a little bit of digging and, 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 and of course my little investigative journalism and spoke to one of the minister of foreign affairs for the former administration. And he said that gentleman, you don't remember that name at all, and that gentleman was not on their list as far as his knowledge. How did Mr. Narari get on the list until he's been terminated? That's what we want to know. So the question is, is it true that Mr. Narari as, as ambassador was done by this administration. Is it true what we were told before is a lie? Oh, let me say untruth. It's untruth. Lies are against strong. But they like it so bad. There's also an article which reads on July the 11th, the Prime Minister made an official appointment of the IMO state born Tushi Narari as ambassador 
the 44-year-old Deacon Mitchell of the NDC defeated Keith Mitchell of the ruling party who was seeking re-election of one of the first um, re-election, full stop. One of the first moves after his victory was appointing Narari as ambassador at large for Grenada in Nigeria. The appointment is said to be the first of its kind in Africa, where the official diplomatic headquarters would, will also be situated. Narari's, um, Nigeria's capital, Narari fell well. Narari will, as a result, be the head of the diplomatic mission in Nigeria. The move is expected to bolster economic and bilateral relations between Nigeria and Grenada. So the question is again was Mr. Narari appointed as ambassador at large for Grenada? in Nigeria. Folks, that's a wrap on today's episode of Simon Says. Thank you for being a part of the conversation today. You know, the Simon Says is always where facts come first. Join us next at the next episode next week, same time, same place. See you. Have a great week. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe. And make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode.